Hello and welcome to number 114 of Mark Talks About Everything He's Ever Owned. Um, today is Monday 5th of July 2021 and there's, uh, I've had a few days off because I'm on holiday, I've been quite tired, I've been working quite hard, um, I've been quite exhausted and I've spent a couple of days just doing nothing but sitting on the sofa listening to music and it's been beautiful actually and we should all remember that we were not put on this planet to work uh, but we were put on this planet for no reason sometimes to just be the person whoever it is that we are and so therefore I do these whenever I feel like about whatever I want and since this month July 2021 in fact this week 40 years ago this week REM released their first single, Radio Free Europe. And uh, that felt like a, a, an opportune time to talk about REM's early years signed to IRS Records, uh, which ran up to around about the middle of 1988. Their first five albums, there are three compilations, and a B-Sides album, and a number of uh, reissued live versions and box sets and things like that. And I'm going to talk through... The early REM albums and the early singles and the, everything else that goes with it. Of course, what I could pretend is that I remember it all, which I don't, because my introductory point to REM was watching MTV's 120 Minutes in, I think, early 1988. And they showed the videos for, I remember, The One I Love and It's the End of the World as We Know It. And for those two hours on a Sunday evening in the UK... REM's 120 Minutes was my, my entry point, really. It was my way in. If it was on 120 Minutes, kind of like the John Peel show, kind of like Snob TV, uh, it was one of those things we thought, you're signposting me to things that are bigger and better. Obviously, in the ye olde analogue world, uh, the only records that, that you could hear were the ones that you bought or the ones that you copied on cassette from your friends. And so if I had friends that liked REM, I was going to get to like REM. Um, and now I feel like I'm the only person I really know who absolutely loves REM. All those people that, that I knew way back then, um, I only have regular conversations with, with one of them. Um, and so liking REM in 1987 was driven by a number of factors. But the main one was, could I get the records? Could I listen to the records? Um, because an album was six pounds. That was my week's pocket money. So I was limited to buying 52 albums a year. And in the days when I started going out, less than 52 albums a year, unless I picked up extra work. And of course, singles that I could buy when they fell out of the charts. So I'm not going to pretend that I remember all of this stuff, because I don't. Because R.E.M. were just one of a number of weird bands that I read about, but didn't actually know about. Um, and also, they were a band whose videos I saw on television, uh, whose posters I saw on my friends' walls, whose albums I listened to at their houses. They weren't a band because I was limited. They weren't a band that I, I could love, and I didn't really get to loving them until 1989 when Green came out. So, instead of me saying, uh, just go and buy this, this is a very good biography of the group, by the way, called Fiction by uh, David Buckley. David Buckley's also written a great book about David Bowie, which I think is called Strange Fascination. Uh, which is a great, great story of his life, though obviously the version I've got only goes up to a certain point, misses the ending. Um, this, alongside the REM TV box set documentary, and uh, a number of the other releases which have come out, really interesting. There's also uh, an REM website called the REM Timeline that tells you exactly what the band are up to on any given day, at any given point in time. So if you're not sure what REM are, there's there's basically three like three versions of REM. There's there's the version that made the IRS albums up to 1987 and document. Um, that's the spiky, weird, half mumbled version of the group, which I'll talk about now. Uh, the next version of the group, which ran from Green through to New Adventures in Hi-Fi, is the effectively the Stadium Rock years. You know, the band only played stadiums on one tour in that period uh, with their original drummer, Bill Berry. Uh, and then the third period, um, the the reinvention years uh, after Bill had left, where the band became a trio 
um, and largely played with, with, with extra supporting musicians. Uh, in Europe, they were still absolutely huge, actually, um, right up through to the end, really big band, although in America they noticeably got smaller. But since I'm not American, it doesn't bother me in the slightest that. What bothers me now, as William Burroughs once said, is nothing here but the recordings. There's nothing left but the records now of R.E.M. And so my experiences of them, I have to just remember them through through the recordings. So, as I mentioned, to start with, they released their first single in 1983, uh, 1981, 8th of July, Radio Free Europe, backed with Sitting Still, which is currently due to be reissued any day now. As R.E.M. and our a band that, that exists to release reissues and compilations. This is R.E.M.'s debut album, Murmur, released in 1983. Loads and loads of different versions of Murmur. Everyone who likes R.E.M. will tell you that this is fantastic and the best album that they ever made. Uh, plenty of people that don't like R.E.M. will tell you this was the only good album they ever made and it all went downhill as soon as they started selling records. I'm not one of those snobs. I, I find the IRS years to be the hardest ones, actually. Um, they're the records I listen to least. They're the songs that I know least well. Um, I prefer them from green onwards. Now, not going to muck about there. Um, I think this album is very, very good, uh, Murmur, but it does have some limitations. So there's a, there's a few songs in there that aren't perhaps as good as some of the other ones. And to me, I think Peter Buck said that they wrote something like three albums worth of material and drunk, junked it. Um, and lots of the early songs that they played, uh, songs like Permanent Vacation, Bad Day, um, All the Right Friends, for example, were songs that they later came back to later on in their career, finalised and released. Um, whereas this album has some some clearly not quite so good songs and some really, really good songs. Hi so so the, the highlights of this are the fact that the production is absolutely unique. So R.E.M. at this point sounded like they sounded like a band that had listened to the Velvet Underground, Big Star. They also sounded like a band that had listened to the bands that were influenced by the Velvet Underground and Big Star. Um, and they, you know, shared, they wore their influences on their sleeve with cover versions of uh, Wire songs and Velvet Underground songs. Lots of Velvet Underground songs. I think they recorded four Velvet Underground songs, three of which were, were released during the IRS years. Um, and this album is, is really, really good. It's not amazing for two reasons. I think the first one is the songwriting. They're still learning how to be R.E.M. at this point. They're still learning how to write songs. And a lot of bands, their debut albums aren't as good as everyone wants to pretend that they are because they're learning how to be. They're learning how to write songs. They're learning how to become who they are to create their own artistic identity. Kind of like what that, um, I think that someone said about the statue of Michelangelo, is that it's just a, a piece of rock and then you chip away all the bits that don't look like Michelangelo. You know, R.E.M. at this point were chipping away all the bits that didn't look or sound like R.E.M. And what was left, what they chose to keep, that was what R.E.M. was. But they, they'd fallen into, I think at this point they were writing songs more songs than they, they, there are more songs in this album than songs that they've written, if that makes sense, because some of the songs aren't particularly good. Moral Kiosk isn't great, uh, Shaking Through isn't great, We Walk isn't great, but then on the other hand, there are songs like Radio Free Europe, Pilgrimage, Talk About the Passion, Perfect Circle, Sitting Still, fantastic songs that the band played right until the end of their careers. Uh, I saw them play Perfect Circle at Twickenham in 2008, which was the last time they ever performed Perfect Circle and was later released on a 2009 fan club holiday single. Uh, but uh, no, M Murmur is a great album. It's an acquired taste because like everything at the time, their event had no money and no time. Uh, they were living pretty much hand to mouth, playing hundreds of shows a year, writing songs in sound checks. And what that meant is that you never really had the time to work through what are great lyrics. What are the lyrics to this particular song is this the best vocal melody that you can have? And I think perhaps Michael Stipe was quite shy at that point, and he wasn't like fully leaning into who he was. So, And also there's an element of not wanting to be obvious, not wanting to put everything on the surface and be really open and direct in the songwriting. So um, especially early on, R.E.M. songs, it's difficult to work out what a song like Harbour Coat or Seven Chinese Brothers or Moral Kiosk is, is about. 
if nothing else, only one set of lyrics from the band's existence up to 1996 um, was officially published during the band's lifetime. And I think that was the lyrics to, to What's the Frequency, Kenneth, that were on one of the single, uh, single sleeves. Now, Murmur is a great album. Um, it's available quite cheaply uh, and readily available. This version, the one which I recommend if you're going to buy REM records, this is the version to get, which is the double CD featuring a live set recorded at Larry's Hideaway in Toronto uh, in July 1983, which is you know two years to the week after Radio Free Europe came out, and also, somewhat surprisingly, 38 years ago this week. Uh, Murmur is a good album. It's not my favourite REM album at all. Uh, there is meant to be some form of remaster or on the CD. I cannot detect a difference, actually, between the Murmur remaster and the Murmur original. It sounds like the drums are recorded under pillowcases. It sounds like the vocals have been taken down to zero and then made a little bit quieter. Uh, the vocals aren't especially clear. Um, it's really difficult to work out what the lyrics are to some of the tracks on here. Um, it's not a, a, a fantastic album for that. It's not a sincere, direct, straightforward, straight ahead record. It's very much an album of its of its time, and it's very much an album that captures a snapshot in time. Also, very similarly, a lot of bands that the bands were uh, that REM were being compared to, or REM were seeing as their contemporaries, people like Cocteau Twins, for example, um, were also kind of working in that that same kind of soundscape unclear vocals kind of approach which which the band did on murmur um do buy this by the way it's a great rem album however it's probably not the first one to get if you're going well where do i start with rem probably best to buy the compilations uh either the 2011 all the singles chronologically in order part lies part truth part heart part garbage or perhaps if you're interested in this period of the band uh eponymous which I can never pronounce correctly, um, and and the band has a you know a number of of other releases around this time. They released Radio Free Europe again as a single. They released some other singles, um, but the, the first single I own from the second album is uh, So Central Rain, South Central Rain. I'm sorry, which is uh, presented here in its 12 inch version, which is backed with uh, the voice of Harold and Pale Blue Eyes, the first of the Velvet Underground covers which I'm going to mention. So um, I didn't buy this when it came out. The the B side, I bought singles for the B sides. I couldn't afford to buy singles. Also, this came out when I was about 10. Uh, and when I was about 10, I was far more interested in films with the names War, Star, Super, Superman, Star Wars, War Games, those type of things. Those were the movies I was interested in. That was the music I was interested in, not in R.E.M. Uh, this is a water damaged 12 inch but it was also dirt cheap um, and obviously as i've said before when i was buying records when i was younger i was buying records because i could afford them and not i wasn't buying them for the covers the second album is uh, this one here reckoning uh, which again was recorded in a hurry the songs were written during sound checks on the murmur tour and it's got 10 10 songs on it it's got some classics it's got some songs i can't really remember uh, it's got camera on, which I think the band play, have played three times since the 80s. Uh, it's got uh, Second Guessing, Southern Central Rain, uh, Pretty Persuasion, and Don't Go Back to Rockville uh, with a lead vocal by Mike Mills. Don't Go Back to Rockville, fantastic. Played live many, 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 many times. Um, the uh, the reissue version of it, by the way, uh, is back to the a second disc a live show uh, recorded at i think the aragon ballroom in chicago in july 1984 the, by the way both the aragon ballroom and larry's hideaway toronto are not full shows they are missing a few songs from the set uh, they've never said why that is presumably it's to do with either the quality of the performance or the quality of the recording or or, um, or maybe the mix was incorrect the demos have not been released from these albums although the band's first cassette demo called the cassette set uh, is going to be released in some kind of mega bundle shortly. You know, if you buy the seven inch of Radio Free Europe, the cassette and a t-shirt for about fifty pounds, and I really hate that kind of packaging. To be honest, I'd buy the cassette, I'd buy the seven inch, and I'm not going to pay fifty pounds for a seven inch and a cassette and the t-shirt because I've already got enough bloody band t-shirts 
uh, just sell me the music guys I will buy it don't sell me the extra stuff I don't need it so this is the the two CD version of Reckoning uh, which was reissued 2009 on the 25th anniversary of the release of the album uh, and um, it comes in a, a poster sleeve here you can have a fold out the poster of the sleeve for Reckoning and the B-side has a number of explanatory essays and extra detail that goes into it. Um, I must admit, if I'm talking about R.E.M. albums that I love, this one is, is down the bottom, I'm afraid to say. All the IRS albums are not near the top. Um, because I don't think that the band were... They hadn't mastered the art of making records. They were great at writing songs during the IRS years. They weren't so great at making albums. And they weren't so great at perhaps making songs that I could latch to. And if you've, you've watched any of the other one, earlier ones of these, you'll know I'm a words guy. I'm really interested in the words. And the words in the songs have got to be good to drag me in. Or they've either got to be good in a, a brilliant erudite way, or they've got to be good in a boneheaded, stupid way. Um, and the words on this, I can't make out the words to most of them. Um, although this has got more great songs on it, I think. The Murmur, as I've mentioned before, Pretty Persuasion, Don't Go Back to Rockville. Uh, Southern Central Rain, Second Guessing, great, great songs. Uh, but then if you can ask me, well, what's how, what's the chorus to Letter Never Sense? And I'm like, I haven't got a bloody clue. You know, I've had this album for 20, 30 years, and I don't, I still can't remember the chorus to it. Uh, it's a good thing I'm not in REM, actually, because they'd fire me for not knowing the songs, as opposed to me thinking perhaps that they weren't writing the best songs that they ever could. There's also a bootleg CD, by the way, that's come out this period, uh, REM. Uh, which I think is called Right on Target, which was recorded at the Capitol Theatre in New Jersey in June 1984. There's a really interesting set of, of almost copyright extension, grey area releases from 20, 30 years ago, uh, which are officially released in, I think, places like Italy on bizarre and unusual labels that specialise in radio broadcasts. They're pressed once, they disappear, you never see them again. Um, the profit margins are low, the print runs are low, the quality is not amazing. This this clearly it doesn't look uh, like an REM album of the same quality that you would expect from Reckoning. Um, but if you're if you're the kind of person like me, a budget collector, uh, or more correctly a record collector that but that has a budget, I'm the kind of spot that would buy stuff like this. So the third album, um, uh, I must say, Murmur is really good reckoning not so good fables of the reconstruction of the fables um and this is a, a i think it's a very good record it's nowhere near the be the best of rem which isn't a nice way of saying i think rem got better over time but fables of the reconstruction you can tell even though you know the cover art that we've got on things like reckoning and on murmur and uh, on um, the other albums these are not hit albums these are not the kind of covers that you would get if you wanted to sell thousands of copies or millions of copies there's something about the cover art that the band have at this time the visual design that the band have that very clearly indicates that sorry i dropped something rem are almost like the world's biggest kept best kept secret um, and you know if you listen to rem you knew something other people didn't. You were inside the whale. You knew the codes. Um, in the same way that when I've talked in earlier episodes about being a, a member of certain subcultures, certain uh, gender persuasions, sexualities, certain scenes, is that, you know, there were ways of signifying that you were in on the, on the secret. And REM, you know, these record covers, such as this one, this one, which is Life's Rich Pageant, uh, and this one, document it feels like you're holding mass-produced works of art it doesn't feel like you're you're holding a record with a picture of a millionaire standing on the front looking moody next to a strategically placed motorbike and a ruined garage this is uh, you know this is rem going well actually here's a book of fables and we're inviting you in to our secret world um maybe i'm reading too much into it i don't know this by the way is the i think the 2011 or 2010 25th anniversary edition they changed the format in 2000 uh, and, and 10 or 11 for these releases uh 2010 according to the copyright notice on the box they changed the format so you had a box that went in there and then the cds were effectively inside uh, vinyl replica sleeves so 
Uh, and the other reason is I didn't have vinyl copies of these because I bought vinyl copies of the albums when I was building my record collection in the late 80s and early 90s and nobody sold REM LPs. They kept REM LPs. They, those were never traded in. People didn't grow out of REM in much the same way as Metallica records. Really, really hard to get on the second-hand market because people just didn't trade them in. People traded in Iron Maiden. They traded in Guns N' Roses. Uh, but REM, Metallica, some, uh, the, the Cure, Depeche Mode, some bands, they just never traded in. So these are vinyl replica kind of versions of the them on CD, aside from you know the, this, which is a reproduction of the original label that we've got on there. So front and, and, and back of um, Fables of the Reconstruction. Again, it doesn't say, it says it's digitally remastered, but again, I can't tell the difference to these. It might be the kind of remastering that's very sympathetic. There is some terrible remastering out there. Um, REM are not that band. Even though Michael Stipe is in no way an audiophile, he doesn't even have a record player in his flat or his apartment in, in New York. Uh, Peter Buck and Mike Mills are very, very much aware of this. And of course, by the way, REM are one of those bands that have had uh, pretty much the same lineup all the way through. Only one person has left REM, and that was Bill Berry, as I'll discuss in a, another kind of instalment there. Uh, but they've had the same four stroke three members all the way through. It's not been a kind of band where you see it and the lineup changes every week. Uh, but like Rush, like U2, like Metallica, uh, REM are one of those bands that have kept, if not the same, then almost exactly the same lineup all the way through. Very, very few people have ever left. Um, the second disc on the reissue of Fables of the Reconstruction are the Athens demos recorded in 1985, which is where the band went into the studio for one day and recorded it. So this is kind of like if they were going to do a vinyl record store day version of Fables with demos, that would be the sleeve. Um, and the demos that are on the, the album are, are detailed somewhere in this package. But there's a, you know, around an hour's worth of demos, including B-sides. Um, so there's a, a booklet which has you know, pictures and single covers and things like that that's in there. Um, there's, a, there's a difficult track listing for this album because it doesn't tell you what the track listing is. It only tells you on the disc, and the track listing that's on the disc, by the way, is out of sequence. So let's quickly uh, let's quickly just see if we can if I can remember what's on these. Because like Michael Stipe, I don't remember what album uh, which one of these songs are on. So yeah, on this one, so there are some. The songwriting is getting better. It's getting stronger. It's becoming more accessible. Michael Stipe's becoming more confident in his singing style, and the lyrics are becoming stronger and better. I think. Uh, so feeling gravity's Paul, maps and legends, driver eight, can't get there from here. And uh, those are great, great songs, by the way, um, and songs that st that went down well when I, when I saw them play in stadiums, even in in the nineties and in the in the noughties. Um, and the other thing around the band is that they had you know four really strong personalities, and they had four uh, really strong kind of songwriters as well. So this is uh, the postcards. They come with a version of fables. And there is uh, a booklet that goes with it, uh, but also a humongous fold-out poster. I don't know quite why. I mean, you could actually probably make some money if you, you'd done this poster. I mean, just look at how many folds and creases there are in this. It feels like one of those ancient computer games when you had to get a colour chart and a bar and you had to kind of point out, and it would go D7F3 and then you had to to type in a colour or a word and it was some kind of weird anti-piracy device and uh, nobody really understood it but you had to spend a pound to get a colour photocopier uh, and then of course you got around the copy protection activity. Fables of the Reconstruction is, is a good album. Again, again, individual songs but somehow the final album is kind of less than the sum of the parts. Here's a, a 12 inch, again also water damaged, I can't get there from here, an extended mix of that backed with uh, Bandwagon and Burning Hell. Uh, both are the band's original material. Uh, I have no memory of what the extended mix of Can't Get There From Here looks like. Uh, in the old fashioned days, they'd take an instrumental seven inch and just slop it at the beginning. And then the vocals would start halfway through. Um, there was also uh, a seven inch and uh, a 12 inch of Wendell G. Uh, which is backed with Crazy and a live version of Driver 8. 
Um, and this was recorded, the whole of the album, by the way, was recorded in London in March 1985, when the band didn't have much money. Uh, but again, this wasn't a big hit. There was a double seven inch of it. There was, you know, the band were formatting this stuff, uh, but it wasn't going particularly well. And for some reason, um, Don't Go Back to Rockville was, was reissued. Uh, as a, and here's the 12 inch, uh, which is backed with Wolves from the Chronic Town EP, which will appear later and uh live versions of gardening at night and nine nine recorded in paris in mono um so not sure if those live tracks have ever been reissued actually but there you are and that's got a slightly different irs catalog number which indicates it came out out of sequence um life switch pageant at this point by the way this is the man's fourth album in four years they're they're pretty much putting 90% of all the songs that they write onto albums and those albums are, be are going really really well uh, so this is I, I think this is a really great album this is this is the, the 2010 2 CD reissue version and again let's have a, a look inside here so we have well we have the postcards of band members uh, and they're so tightly snug inside the box I can't even get them out the second disc on this is Athens Demos. So we've got the album itself here. Uh, again, the sequence on the back of the sleeve is not the same as the sequence that's actually, that actually plays when you play the record. Uh, and uh, there's what, 12 tracks on there, although there's only 10 that are listed on this. So uh, Superman is not listed on there, even though it's on the album. Um, and then there's a second CD of Athens demos here which is uh, this way up which is I think nine, 19 songs recorded um, in a demo session including a number of b-sides and a number of unreleased songs uh, King of the Birds um, or King of Birds which became a song on the, on the next album is on here Hyena is on here as well as a demo version of Bad Day Underneath the Bunker and uh, there's one called Jazz, which is Rotary 10. There's a song called Rotary 11, which appears on, on green. There's also Two Steps Onwards, uh, Just a Touch, Mystery to Me, Wait, All the Right Friends, and uh, What If We Give It Away are on here. So the two CD version has six or seven previously un unavailable songs, and the, and the rest of them are alternate demo versions. So this is um, the booklet for Low Switch Pageant. Uh, mostly details it because at the time by the way booklets for cds people weren't paying any attention to them at all you know the care and attention was really being lavished on the lp on the uh, inner sleeve of the lp and the artwork that went with it so at the time that these were issued on cd for the first time there was no no real care around it you might get an extra photograph but that was it really you know you'd get a you know you'd, you'd get a four page booklet um, there was just really a reprint of the inner sleeve, and it was really tiny. Uh, again, there's a, a poster. Let's open this one up. I should probably put these up in my uh, in my chateau, uh, but uh, there's um, yeah, a picture of, of four people, uh, not not quite rich yet. So there you have it. And then you've got um, the the postcards which are in here. Now, I think Life's Rich Pageant is a really, really good album, by the way. Um, and, you know, again, if you're going to get a version of it and you can get it, get the two CD version with the demos. It really kind of fills in the, the picture of what R.E.M. were at the time. And this album, by the way, does have some really, really very good songs on it. So it's got uh, Begin the Begin. Uh, it's got, I believe, These Days, Cuyahoga. Um, great songs, actually. All ones which have been played live right through to the end of the band's live career. Um, and sometimes incredible. I remember, I think, was it Twickenham? I think they played these days. And seeing them in a football stadium playing to 80,000 people, playing a song that, when it came out, they were playing to 800,000 people is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty something. So the, the next album, uh, album five, is Document, released in 1987. Um, and this is a... This is where I think R.E.M. started to make bloody brilliant albums as opposed to just write brilliant songs, uh, but not necessarily great albums. You know, um, the songwriting, I think, had, had taken a huge leap on here. Um, so this album has Finest Work Song, uh, Welcome to the Occupation, Etienne McCarthy, 
it's the end of the world as we know it and i feel fine the one i love um some some brilliant brilliant songs on it so again this is the i think this is 2012 2013 uh double cd 25th anniversary edition again comes in a box unsurprisingly there's a cd and an lp replica sleeve some postcards that are so tight inside the box you can't get them out uh, and here's a, a live set recorded at the work tour in utrecht in uh, the netherlands one of my favorite countries in the world uh, on september the 14th 1987 the live cd by the way is missing several songs so it's missing cover versions of superman why is strange uh, a cover version of i think a peter gabriel song red rain um, and an acoustic version of time after time uh, you can get by the way south central rain and time after time which are on the live performance uh, in full on a b-side cd i will come to that shortly but those two songs were taken off this version the 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 double cd because otherwise the cd would have been 84 minutes long and would have required two two cds so again the booklet is unamazing and the poster uh, this is perhaps again folded more times than it strictly needs to be if this poster were in a movie it would be the movie where somebody puts the map all over the screen of the car in the 80s and the car drives through some cardboard boxes because that's how big the poster is on here i don't think anybody would ever use these as posters because again they're all folded and as we all know the best posters in the world are rolled so that they don't have crease marks although life itself has crease marks document love this album again you can't go wrong they didn't make a bad album they just didn't make any great ones and that's a controversial statement and i'm sure some of you will hate on me for saying that i don't think murmur is particularly amazing but it's all part of life's rich pageant so we're going into the reissues period of, of the band now um but before we get to the reissues period we also have to address uh a couple of other things which is that uh, this is the finest work song 12 inch um, which features the b-side which i mentioned earlier time after time red rain and so south and central rain recorded in utrecht and uh it features the lengthy club mix and the other mix of finest work song now the lengthy club mix and the other mix are just remixes of the lp versions uh, but with horns on and they decided to take the horns off for the final album uh, and then keep the horns on for the single release of finest work song so there you have it um there's yeah not a huge difference really in there following on from that the band fulfilled their their deal with irs records uh they've gone through it they've released five albums in five years very very quickly never really stopping never really pausing for breath never doing anything apart from playing touring writing recording it was a treadmill and it, it was quite a tough one as well actually um there was a couple of other releases which came out at around about the same time now depending upon the chronology and i have to check the catalogue numbers for this um bugger wouldn't you know i can't tell the first compilation which came out at the end of the irs period uh, was this b-sides album dead letter office uh, that features all the b-sides plus a number of unreleased songs and it also features the band's first EP called Chronic Town, which was released in 1982. I don't have a copy of it on 12 inch. However, thanks to the wonders of uh, CD cases, you can see that actually the cover of Chronic Town is, is here. Right, and the artwork is reproduced there. So you could officially say, well, I've got a Chronic Town on CV, CD. It's... um. An interesting little release, Chronic Town, being the first EP, but it's very clearly kind of like a precursor to something bigger and better. Dead Letter Office is one of the best B-side albums there ever is. Lots of bands were doing B-side albums at this point. Jesus Mary Chain did Barbed Wire Kisses and The uh, the Sound of Speed. Um, who else did? The Smiths did Hatful of Hollow and The World Won't Listen. You know, um, lots of bands did B-sides albums around about this time. There's a nice way of getting all of the B-sides on CD if you didn't have any of them. And at a budget price. But uh, also there was a second compilation CD released not long after, uh, which is the band's first 
compilation of hits, although they didn't have any hits, so it was a singles compilation called Eponymous. Uh, this is the CD edition from 1988, um, and it, it features a, a couple of rarities on there, actually. This is a really great entrance point if you're interested in REM in the 80s, is to buy Eponymous, and if you like it, then you can go from there. So it's got the original single version of Radio Free Europe, it's got a different vocal mix of Gardening at Night, and it has got the... Um, the, the, the horns version of Finest Work Song. It also has a previously not on an REM song, uh, a song that's on the soundtrack to uh, a film which they will not name. Um, oh, our, not Alan Roldolf's um, 1987 film Made in Heaven. Uh, and this track is called Romance, uh, which was written in the, in the early 80s, about 1983, alongside uh, a track called Stumble. And it's a, it's a great chronological run through the band's single releases from 1981 through to 1987. This is a, an IRS Records 1988 edition uh, of the LP with the, uh, the, the lovely sticker asking you to REM, re-experience the moments. And uh, perhaps one of the finest back sleeves you've ever seen which kind of recasts Michael Stipe as being a very handsome young man with they airbrushed my face in big letters on there. Nothing if uh, if not <laughs> sly and wryly mocking of everything that goes in it. Of course, that's not uh, that's not all for the uh, the IRS years. Um, the band had lots and lots of work which came out in a multitude of other releases. And of course, why not go through those now, um, to stand alongside the release of um, Eponymous, the one I love, was, was issued on CD. Here's a CD single. This one's backed with live tracks recorded acoustically at McCabe's Guitar Shop. And this one is backed with live tracks Driver 8, Disturbance at the Heron House, and Crazy. Um, when they did two CDs in a two CD set, I thought that was a, not amazing. Coming to the late 90s, the band also released this, which is called Essential, which is a contractual obligation album, uh, which features a very, very small number of previously unavailable songs. Uh, so they performed a couple of songs, Swan Swan Hummingbird, and uh, All I Have to Do is Dream Dream Dream, for uh, a film called Athens Inside Out. Um, those were released on CD here. Uh, there was a song called Tired of Sinking Trouble, which came out um, on a B-side. Toys in the Attic's on here. It gets its first album appearance, as does Last Date. The uh, the medley of Time After Time, which I've mentioned before, which is cut in half on the document reissue, gets its full-length appearance here. Um, and there's a, a number of other live songs, including a cover of Aerosmith's Toys in the Attic, of all things. 2006. Uh, when the band were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, saw the release of the second of the major IRS compilations uh, called And I Feel Fine. And this CD, uh, C CD, double CD, and this DVD edition called When the Light Is Mine, both featuring photographs from the band's first or second show, I think. That's uh, one of the very early shows. Um, this is a very good best of. The second CD has a number of rare and unreleased songs on here. It has demos of Gardening at Night and uh, Bad Day and Mystery to Me and All the Right Friends. Um, it has live versions of We Walk, Ages of You, A Million and Just a Touch live in the studio. It's got the acoustic tracks from Athens GA, by the way, on here, Inside Out. It's got a demo of Hyena. And it's got the uh, the hip tone A and B sides of the single Radio Free Europe and standing and and sitting still. So if you are into getting all the B sides and all the rarities and stuff, you do have to get the two CD versions of. I mean, effectively, uh, yeah, you have to get Murmur, Reckoning, uh, Life Switch Pageant, Fables of the Reconstruction and document in the two CD versions. And you also do have to get the two CD version of this. 
Um, you can live without getting the essential compilation. Uh, you do need to have Dead Letter Office. Um, but, you know, all the studio albums are best of in the B-Sides compilation. It's probably as good as you can get. This is one of the other things that came out, the DVD for the period. This is uh, very, very worth getting uh, if you're an REM completist. The version of South Central Rain on here, by the way, has a different vocal take. Michael didn't like lip syncing, so he sang the vocal again into the microphone whilst the band mimed to the instrumental version behind him. It also has a couple of TV appearances in it from a show called The Cutting Edge. Um, final thing to come out from the period is on this R.E.M. at the BBC box set, one CD is recorded live at Nottingham in 1984 that was broadcast on the BBC. And what I should say is the band were, were, didn't do a huge amount in terms of live on television or live on the radio kind of stuff. They did some live shows, four, five, six maybe. Um, Nottingham, Larry's in Toronto, Chicago, Utrecht and a couple of others as well, um, one of which is on that, uh, that other CD. So I think maybe Boston uh, and the show that's on here. Um, but there aren't that many live shows circulating, um, although, of course, someone will inevitably tell me if I'm wrong. And in terms of TV appearances, they did a couple of appearances on, I think, The Tube on the BBC, um, which, are, which is on here. Uh, live, Old Grey Whistle Test, The Tube in 1983 and 1985. And cutting edge so you can get almost all of the band's worthwhile tv appearances on this here uh, this if you really are only hardcore into the irs years has only got one show which was recorded at nottingham in 1984 on it so rem's irs years i think overall is is a great period of the band uh, it's not by any means my favorite period and i will talk about each individual album as we move on from here by the way um my knowledge of R.E.M. is I came to R.E.M. when this period was just ending, so I have no contemporary memories of this period at all. R.E.M. at this period in their career are just uh, a historical artefact to me. They're a band who grew up in public, but I wasn't looking. So I got to, to hear and see things like Murmur, Reckoning, Fables, all out of sequence and out of time. I was going backwards in history. So those albums were history lessons when I listened to them. I hadn't built contemporary memories of them. Um, and it was difficult to go, right, so you know, I can see the genus, I can see the DNA of the band that I love in that band, but they were growing into who they were going to become. Um, but it's a fascinating thing, actually, to be an R.E.M. fan is to know. I don't think of these records as 30 or 40 years old. I think of them as like five or six years old. And partially that's because we live time and experience time in a very different way as we change through time. But also because, you know, to me, I remember when this was the latest R.E.M. album. I remember when, when Document was the most recent studio album. I remember when, when these things were starting to happen. And so to think of these as kind of like historical things that happened 40 years ago is really, really strange to me. Uh, and I've had a birthday since the last time that we, we had, um, since the last time I made one of these, these conversations. And so for me to experience it and to think about it in the passing of time is I'm just building new memories at the back of this. Uh, these memories are still kind of fresh and new. Um, so Epinonymous is, is probably the best place to start actually, if you're not sure about R.E.M., if you can find the copy affordably, pick it up. This is the copy that I've been listening to for 33 years now, uh, and I know every scratch and jump on it. Um, sadly, i put this here. Maybe I can pretend that this is actually my face and they airbrush my face. Uh, certainly, what you will find is they've forgotten to airbrush hair into the current version of me, but you can't have it all. Um, so... Although this says Vintage R.E.M., the band you grew up with on the cover, uh, that that sticker was there, you know, day one. So the band were already classing themselves as, as a vintage group. I think it was a little bit piss takey. So although it says on here, re-experience every moment. Um, R.E.M. could stand for three things, really. Uh, one is rapid eye movement. 
But the other one, and I think the one that Michael Stein mentioned when they had the Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction in 2007, were the words of his grandmother, where he, she said, remember every moment. I'm starting forget, to forget the things that happened when this came out, that I lived at the time, when I lived in, in a, a, you know, an upstairs back bedroom um, in Northfield Road. I'm forgetting all of that stuff. So one of the reasons I do these is that so I'm able to at least talk about my memories before I lose the memories forever. Um, and that's it. Remember every moment. So I'm going to stop here. Next REM one I'm going to talk about is going to be green. Uh, I'm also going to give a shout out to the people on Twitter because I put four options up on Twitter. I put Stanley Kubrick, REM, early David Bowie and Pet Shop Boys Fundamental. REM won with 60% of the vote. And I am nothing but a shameless crowd pleaser. Um, I, I listened, and here it is. Hopefully, um, the future times I talk about REM are going to be a little bit more exciting because I will have lived those day by day, single by single, show by show. Uh, but in the meantime, this is REM, the IRS years, the early years of the band, the first five albums, the first era of the band's existence. And, um, you know, experiencing it by going backwards in time, that was wild to get in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and if you're only just discovering REM, I'm very jealous of you. Okay, stay beautiful. I will see you all again some other time. Bye.